This is a Florida contract. We're talking 13 pages, 611 lines, and up to 32 addendum that can be applied to this contract. It's in my contract. There are tons of opportunities to make mistakes in here that could cost you a ton of money. I'm the money. Imagine waking up after closing and realizing you have a $50,000 assessment that you have to pay. Or imagine walking into your brand new home and your washer and dryer are missing. Something is missing. These are real scenarios that really do happen, but no worries. By the time you're done watching this video, you're gonna know how to avoid this happening to you. My name is Chris Cusimano. I'm a real estate agent in Palm Beach and Broward counties in Southeast Florida. I have been in the business for well over 20 years now. I have written and negotiated thousands of contracts and I've seen simple contract errors cost buyers and sellers thousands. Today, I'm going to cover some of the most common contract mistakes that I see. And hopefully by the end of the video, you can learn from this so these mistakes don't happen to you. Number one, missing appliances. Page one of the standard as is Florida contract lists all of the appliances that come with the house. But if you dive in deeper, there's something missing. Actually, two things missing the washer and dryer. If your agent doesn't know any better or if you don't know any better and there's a washer and dryer on the property and you didn't manually add in the verbiage that you wanna keep the washer and dryer, then technically it is the property of the sellers and they can remove it and take them with them. I am. I'm taking it. <laughs> so this is what you do to prevent this from happening. You wanna add this phrase to the as is contract on lines 21 and 22. All attached appliances and fixtures, including the washer and dryer and hurricane shutters, if any, and if they were present during the showing. Now, if you don't do this and the washer and dryer are gone, well, you're gonna learn a mistake that I had to learn the hard way. When I was a newer agent, I didn't understand this contract. And when I went to a walkthrough with my buyers, we noticed that these were missing. I reached out to the listing agent who wasn't present and all he said to me was, Chris, know your contracts. As annoyed as I was with him, he taught me a valuable lesson and I never made that mistake again. For me and my clients in that particular situation, guess what happened? I had to buy him a washer and dryer. Number two, invalid commission request on the contract. I see this in probably 80% of the contracts that I review. And full disclaimer, this may change with the new NAR settlement laws, but as of this recording, this is still applicable. If you take a look at lines 643 and 644, it clearly states that the contract can't modify MLS compensation offers. Agents, if you want to negotiate your commission, there are ways to do it and this isn't it. Number three, we're gonna dive back into the appliances section and it's about refrigerators. Yes, I said refrigerators. In the contract, there is an S there as in plural. And this is a mistake that a lot of the sellers that I have worked with and spoken with get mixed up about. Many people have a beer fridge in their garage and they might wanna take it with them or they might wanna swap out that beer fridge for a less desirable one, but they can't. Unless it's specifically omitted from the contract, all refrigerators come with the house. You think I don't know what breaks my fridge? <laughs> Also, if you're a buyer and you want to make sure those refrigerators stay, make sure you bring this up to the listing agent so their clients know not to take this fridge. If you are a seller and you want to take it, you can see in section one and line 24 that you can write in that you want to take this fridge in just about anything else. And remember, a good refrigerator can cost $2,000. That's a lot of money to lose by simply not paying attention to the contract. Number four, permits. And this is important. When you're in a real estate transaction, you're gonna have a title company pull a lien search and liens do need to be cleared. What doesn't need to be cleared and not automatically written into the agreement or the contract are permits. If you are a buyer, make sure you or your agent add the verbiage that the seller will close any active, inactive, and or expired permits prior to closing. If you don't manually write that in there and there are open permits or inactive permits on the property, the seller is not obligated to close them out. And also, if you take on this property and you try to sell it later and another buyer's real estate agent comes in and adds that verbiage in there, then you may be stuck closing out permits that weren't even yours in the first place. I'll make my own permits. Before we move on to number five, I'm going to ask you for a quick favor. And that is if you're getting value from this video and want to see more videos just like it, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell to be alerted to see more videos just like this. Number five, title policy. Now in Palm Beach County, it is customary for the seller to choose the title company and pay for the title policy. In Broward County, Florida, it is customary for the buyers to do that. However, it's not set in stone and everything is negotiable. If the situation calls for it, it may make sense for you to check the box that best suits your financial needs. And this is a big one because title policies are expensive. I can provide you with a full title policy rate sheet if you want, just shoot me a message and I'll send it over to you right away. But this is what you can expect to pay. For a $400,000 sale, a title policy is $2,000 
$3,075. For a $700,000 policy, you can expect to pay $3,575. And let's say you bought a house for a million dollars. A title policy for a million dollar home will cost you $5,075. This is real money that can be negotiated away if the situation calls for it. And if you're wondering what a title policy is, it is title insurance. It protects the buyers after closing for any title defects that might have been on the title. And the title policy isn't optional, it's required to sell. So make sure you check off the appropriate box. Check the box. Number six is home warranties. And this box is an optional field for people to check off when you're making offers. And when I have buyers, I always recommend that we do so. Now, home warranty, not to be confused with home insurance, is additional benefit that you can put onto your house. For both of my properties, I have home warranties and they have saved me thousands. Basically how they work is if any of your appliances break, you pay a service fee and someone comes out to fix that appliance. And if they can't fix it, they replace it for free. Different companies have different perks and benefits, so make sure you review their specific policies before you make a decision on the home warranty. Regardless, if the situation calls for it and you're a buyer, there's no harm in checking that box off and seeing that the seller is willing to pay for a home warranty for you. Now, as a seller, there is a benefit for you to provide a home warranty to the buyer. Let's say if you have aging appliances, like your fridge. Let's say your fridge is on its last legs, but it still works. And you don't feel like you are obligated to provide a credit to a buyer for a fridge if it works. However, on the buyer's stance, they're, they're thinking, well, this fridge can go at any time and I don't wanna have to worry about having my spoiled dinner when I come home from work one day. So in that case, as a seller, you can say, hey, if you see that your fridge is acting up, no worries. You can call the home warranty company and they can come out and fix the fridge for you or replace it. And a home warranty, if you offer it to a buyer is typically far less expensive than if you fixed all of your aging appliances if you have older appliances in your house that you're selling. Household appliance? Household appliance, yes. Number seven, mismatching contracts and addendums. In Florida, most people use the standard as is contract like you see here. However, there are actually two contracts that people use that one and the CRIS, the CRSP. I don't even know what CRSP stands for because I never use it. However, some agents do. Yet what happens often is that agents will use one contract, but the addendum of the other. Let's say for example, the house is in a homeowner's association. You need to put on a homeowner rider or addendum on the contract. They'll have a far bar standard as is contract, but a crisp addendum, basically making the contract invalid. If something goes wrong in the transaction, technically one of the parties has an out because they don't even have a valid contract. Is there any validity to this? So make sure that you line up your FAR bar contract with your FAR bar addendum or your crisp contracts with your crisp addendums so your contracts are valid. Number eight, such a common mistake I probably see the most and those are acceptance dates. When you're negotiating a contract, it's typical for it to go back and forth for a few days. So if you're writing up an offer and the acceptance date is say July 3rd and your negotiations go until July 6th, what's very common is that all the changes in the negotiation were changed, but the acceptance date wasn't changed and remained July 3rd on the contract. However, everyone signed on July 6th. If this happens, the acceptance date was not met and that contract is technically not valid, giving either the buyer or seller an out. Can you imagine if you were selling your home and this happened and then you're in a disagreement with the buyer and the buyer used this as an out after the inspection period cleared and that you already had a moving truck plan and your kids' schools were already changed? Give us our apartment back. <laughs> This could happen. So make sure you nip it in the bud right off the bat and change the acceptance date to match a date at or after the time frame in which all parties have signed the contract. Oh boy, number nine is a big one. It is special assessments. There's two boxes in the contract for special assessment. Let me be clear. There's actually one in the main body of the contract and there's one in the HOA or condo rider or condo addendums. The first one is on lines 194 to 198. And this applies to municipal assessment meaning the government. These are assessments that a government is applying to the homeowners of a project that the government is fixing or correcting. This is not the same as an HOA assessment. And a lot of people get this mixed up. Now, if you have an HOA homeowner association, or if you're in a condo and you have a condo association, there are addendums that you need to attach to the contract. And inside of those addendums, there's an additional checkbox of who covers HOA or COA assessments at or after the closing. For HOA addendums, you can see this 
in line 2B. And for condo addendums, you can see this in section C2. If you miss these things as a buyer and you didn't realize or look into it, if there are assessments present, then you will be on the hook with any special assessments after the fact. And pro tip, when you get the estoppel letter back from the HOA, it will likely say if there are any assessments ongoing or pending. Keep an eye out on that because if you miss that and title doesn't correctly indicate and charge at closing who pays for the assessments, it could cost you a lot of money or a hefty legal bill when you try to fight it. Those are the nine most common mistakes I see buyers and sellers make on real estate contracts that can cost them a lot of money. And once again, thank you for your time for watching this video. And if you're planning on moving to or from the Palm Beach or Broward County areas of Southeast Florida, please reach out to the Homes by Koozie team because we can help.